Item number SCP-350 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures When not under experimentation, SCP-350 should be contained within a locked storage unit. No personnel other than those undergoing experimentation with SCP-350 should be allowed to sign SCP-350, no matter what might be offered in exchange. Those who have signed SCP-350 should be allowed to fulfill the terms of SCP-350 until the terms conflict with Foundation interest, at which point they should be restrained or terminated as necessary. Any staff member above Level 3 caught signing SCP-350 for any reason must be immediately terminated. SCP-350 appears to be a single-page contract, followed by 49 blank sheets. The contract outlines a basic exchange of a good or service in exchange for a small amount of money wired to a numbered account at Bank in Zurich, Switzerland. The wording of SCP-350 is different to every reader prior to signature, and the good or service offered is always something the subject has expressed great desire to obtain. The document is also always in the native language of the reader, and conforms to the laws of the nation in which the subject makes their primary residence. Attempts to use video or photography to get an objective image of SCP-350 at this stage have failed, as the text continues to vary from person to person. Upon signing of SCP-350, the variable language property of the contract ceases and the text of the contract stays in the language of the owner of the signature on the document to all readers. The subject will invariably find the object or a proof of service shortly after exiting SCP-350's containment unit, always in a location without direct surveillance. Should the signatory of SCP-350 fulfill the terms of the contract and wire the money to the bank account, SCP-350 begins to add new amendments and terms starting from the second page, most of which demand a minor service of some form from the signatory. However, the complexity of the terms and demands increases with the number of amendments fulfilled, eventually reaching extremes, including, but not limited to, the murder of staff members, the removal of SCP-350 from Foundation containment, and even… Should the signatory not fulfill the original or new terms of SCP-350 for any reason for a full week, they will begin to feel a noticeable urge to complete the current task. This grows into a compulsion on the order of the ticks of those suffering from severe obsessive-compulsive disorder. Should the subject be prevented from completing the terms at this point, the subject will begin to lie, steal, kill, and take other extreme actions to attempt to fulfill the demands of the contract. Psychological analysis at this point reveals nothing, as the subject is utterly fixated on completing the task, to the exclusion of all else. If the subject is restrained from completing the task, the subject will resort to constant escape attempts, refusing to eat, drink, or sleep. Subjects will die unless placed on intravenous fluids and forced into a chemically induced coma. At this point, their metabolism and bodily functions will begin to speed up until the subject dies from either a heart attack or the inability of intravenous therapy equipment to keep up with the metabolism. Item number SCP-095 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-095 is to be placed in a standard polyethylene sleeve when not under scheduled research, and stored in a standard lock filing cabinet to prevent damage or wear. High-resolution digital scans are available for any Level 1 and above personnel who wish to view SCP-095. Description SCP-095 appears to be a set of three moderately-aged black-and-white comic books printed in 1932. The front and rear covers are missing, and several pages were rendered illegible due to water damage. It was found by Agent in a small antique shop in Denver, Colorado, and purchased for a small fee without incident. The owner of the shop had apparently not read the item past the publisher date on the first page. 
Forensic inspections of SCP-095 have revealed it to be genuine, though completely unremarkable save for its content. It is printed on cheap pulp paper and inked with dyes common to other publications of its era. The publisher's stamp indicates it was produced by Future Funnies, a company operating out of the town of Purple Lake, Ohio. All research and inquiries thus far have shown both the company and the town to be completely non-existent. The comic itself is a pulp science fiction story entitled The Atomic Adventures of Ronnie Raygun, featuring a lead character bearing an unmistakable resemblance to former United States President Ronald Reagan. Each story opens with a large panel reading, in the far-fetched future world of the 1980s, only Ronnie Raygun can save the day. It appears to follow an episodic format with one self-contained story per publication. The three stories are briefly described below. Ronnie vs. Space Admiral Carter This story pits planetary governor Ronnie Raygun and his sidekick Space Major Herbert against the titular Space Admiral Carter, as they both vie for the position of Space Marshal. The events loosely follow the events of the 1980 presidential election. Space Assassin This story follows a character named Spaceman Hinckley as he prepares to assassinate Space Marshal Raygun. He manages to catch Raygun by surprise and wound him with a Devastator Ray before being subdued by Raygun soldiers. The events obviously refer to the 1981 assassination attempt by John Hinckley Jr. Jungle Planet this story follows Raygun's attempts to create an army of robots on the jungle-covered planet of Nika in order to protect it from the evil Sand Bandits. Although Raygun is told that he will lose his command if he interferes with events on planet Nika, he sends his lieutenant, Space Colonel West, to secretly build a force under the cover of the jungle. When their plan is discovered, Space Colonel West publicly takes the blame and saves his superior. The storyline appears to be a simplified retelling of the Iran-Contra controversies of 1986. Possibly most interesting is the final page of each book, which advertises other stories published by future funnies. Investigation is underway to locate any surviving copies at once. The advertised stories are listed below. Space Major Herbert assumes command. Starman Willy vs. the Space Succubus. Globe Walker and Sneak Attack. Barry B. Goose and on Planet Afgar, Diamond Donnie and Putting on the Ritz, Skymarm Sarah of the Ice World, Flying Franken vs. Rocket Rush, Star Command Proton in a Losing Battle, The New Menace, Death to Mankind. Personal Log of Dr. Date, October 6, 2004 I don't think I need to emphasize how important it is to recover any and all of the advertised stories immediately. The final two in particular. Item number SCP-152 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-152 is to be kept in a locked chamber in Site-49 henceforth referred to as the Reading Room. The Reading Room is off-limits to personnel below Clearance Level 2. The Reading Room will be equipped with one ceiling lamp, one security camera, one scanner, copy, or printer to be restocked with paper and ink as needed, one standard office chair, and one standard office desk upon which SCP-152 will rest. When not in use, SCP-152 is to be turned to its last page so that any additions made to it can immediately be observed. A single guard would be posted outside of the reading room to deter unauthorized persons from entering the reading room. All personnel are advised to remain quiet if they are near the reading room. SCP-152 is a large, hardbound book with leather bindings. The paper inside resembles vellum, and is written upon in black ink. The contents of the book consist entirely of a series of entries that describe apocalyptic events, which are not always XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios, but invariably deal with the extinction of humanity. The entries are arranged in chronological order, beginning with an unexplained spontaneous failure of the Sun in 6000 BC, and ending with other events close to the present day. Many of the entries describe apocalypses caused or facilitated by objects that are or were in Foundation custody, or are of a paranormal nature. There are also records of human extinction caused by more conventional means, 
such as nuclear warfare or deadly viral epidemics. Each entry describes in some detail the events leading up to the calamity itself, and the aftermath until the point at which the last human on Earth dies. It has been observed that the entries in SCP-152 change to whatever language the reader is most comfortable with, up to the point where sentence structure can change significantly from reader to reader, or even begin using colloquialisms that only the reader would understand. Only the basic meaning of the entries remain constant. If multiple people are looking at SCP-152, it will read in the personal language of whomever began reading first. If no one is directly observing SCP-152, it will display the language of whomever read it last. Rarely, words will appear in the book that do not translate, and instead appear as horizontally arranged calligraphic characters which have not been matched to any known language. To the best knowledge of Foundation historians, most of the information contained in SCP-152 is accurate, diverging only at the point where the apocalypse occurs. In almost all cases, the difference is that a few key decisions were apparently made differently in SCP-152's version of history, leading ultimately to humankind's annihilation. SCP-152 resists all attempts to change or write in it. Inks, graphite, charcoal, and other marking materials do not adhere to the pages, and are easily brushed off. Lasers or other heat sources do not burn into the paper. Close inspection has revealed that foreign substances are stopped from actually coming into contact with the pages. At least five micrometers of empty space are always present between the pages themselves and any foreign materials that might come into contact with them. For this reason, SCP-152 does not decay, which also means that it is proven impossible to determine SCP-152's exact age. SCP-152 is self-updating with newly inked entries and new descriptions of how the last human died appearing at unpredictable intervals, always in the last page of the book. The date that a new entry appears corresponds with the date given in the entry for the death of the last member of the human species. When space becomes an issue, extra pages appear along with the text, and the spine of SCP-152 broadens accordingly. There have been updates to the book since it came into Foundation custody. As with past events, SCP-152 is proven to be up-to-date on current events until the point at which a catastrophe occurs. Because recent entries frequently concern entities or groups of interest to the Foundation, including the Foundation itself, SCP-152 is to be checked regularly for any information of importance. Addendum 1 With the acknowledgement made by letting this thing lie around where the public can find it is dangerous to us. Is there any real reason to study it? Outdated hypothetical disaster scenarios aren't our concern. We've got plenty of real ones in the present to deal with. O5. Addendum 2 The book is accurate enough about pre-disaster Earth that it makes a decent guide to the present. Plus, it gives a little perspective on the big picture of what some SCPs could do if they got loose. I think all researchers with clearance ought to read the last 50 pages or so just to drive home how important what they do here is. For want of a nail and all that. Dr. Jansen Addendum 3 Jansen, half the entries in the last 50 pages show the Foundation screwing up and killing everybody. O5 Addendum 4 Like I said, it gives a little perspective. Dr. Jansen Incident Report 152-05 On the night of The security guard on camera duty noticed that SCP-152 was missing from the reading room. However, by the time she had finished reaching for the switchboard to report this, SCP-152 had reappeared, and there was a new entry on the last page. As this was the fifth such occurrence of sudden disappearance and reappearance, Refer to Incident Reports 152-01 through 152-04. A simple test was conducted with a high-speed camera, a sensitive electronic scale upon which SCP-152 is placed, and an alarm set to go off if the weight upon the scale abruptly changed. The next three updates to SCP-152 all set the alarm off, and the high-speed camera revealed that SCP-152 vanished from sight for exactly one second each time. Addendum 5 I posit that the book isn't actually being updated as such. It's actually being replaced, and each time it changes we are actually receiving a new edition of it. 
I would very much like to find out where these are coming from. Dr. Jansen Item number SCP-423 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-423 is contained in a 5x5m room containing three 2x3m bookshelves. An incinerator is located adjacent. All personnel entering or leaving the room are to be searched for written material. Any written material must be checked for any trace of SCP-423 and then, if found clean, incinerated. At night, SCP-423 is to remain in a small, plain journal marked 423. Failure to remain in this journal at designated times will result in loss of reading material outside of scheduled experiments. SCP-423 is no physical form. It appears to exist entirely within textual narratives. It was discovered in a used bookstore in Texas on 19 in a copy of Tom Sawyer. The book was purchased by Agent who located it during a routine search. Agent brought the book back to Sector 28 as instructed. The book seemed perfectly normal except for the inclusion of a character named Fred, who was not known to exist in any other version of the story. However, it was not until it was left by a copy of Moby Dick that the anomalous nature of SCP-423 became clear. SCP-423 is able to enter textual narratives, inserting itself as a minor character. The details of the character vary from story to story, but it is always named Fred, or something similar, and its role in the story is usually minor. Physical descriptions of the character are rare, but it usually appears as a human male average height in middle years. However, this can change depending on the nature of the narrative. He has appeared as a student in narratives focusing on children, and thus presumably of an appropriate age, or even as a non-human in narratives where humans are absent or rare. At no time is his appearance remarked on as being unusual by other characters. SCP-423 is able to move from one narrative to another voluntarily, provided the two works are within one meter of each other. The process takes up to three minutes depending on the length of the new narrative. The entire narrative changes at once, the text on all pages seeming to move. Occasionally the length of the narrative changes. In these cases, the text grows smaller or larger to fit the page count of the book. It is only able to appear in physical textual narratives. It cannot enter electronic storage or affect purely visual narratives. If placed in proximity to a graphic novel or other form of sequential art, it will change the text boxes and dialogue bubbles, but will not affect the pictures. Similarly, illustrations in a textual narrative do not change, even if they no longer match up to the narrative as affected by SCP-423. It prefers fictional narratives. However, it can enter any narrative that has characters, including anecdotes, biographies, and research notes. See Addendum 423-1. It can re-enter a narrative that is already exited. If it does so, the new narrative typically differs from the last time SCP-423 entered the story. However, it has displayed a preference for narratives it has not yet entered. It is currently unknown what effect dying in a narrative would have on SCP-423 despite the best effort of researchers. SCP-423 displays a strong grasp of narrative principles, and is usually able to predict the best response in a given circumstance to avoid danger to itself. It has, however, displayed minor injuries. However, these seem to vanish when it enters a new narrative. SCP-423 can be communicated with by coaxing it into a journal. It responds to questions written within, with SCP-423's responses appearing underneath the questions. When it transfers to another narrative, its responses disappear from the journal. It has been largely cooperative since its containment. Its only requests so far have been for more narratives. It has expressed a preference for narratives with a large number of background characters, as this makes it easier for it to blend in and, quote, watch the good stuff, unquote. It has been recommended that, should it become uncooperative, it be confined to the journal until it becomes more amenable to staff requests. Researchers who desire more information on SCP-423 should read Experiment Log 423-A. Addendum 423-1 
Researchers are reminded that all physical written material is a potential habitat for 423, and that all notes should therefore be taken electronically. If written notes must for some reason be taken, be sure to check for addenda from guest researcher Fred. Addendum 423-2 The use of SCP-583 to destroy SCP-423 has been suggested. While the SCP is not slated for destruction at the present time, it has been noted should circumstances change. Experiment Log 423-A Experiment Log for SCP-423 Approved by O5 Monitored by O5 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 Project Head Dr. E. Man all researchers working with SCP-423 are encouraged to append their results to this experiment log in the following format. Date Test Material Results Notes Date Test Material Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain Results A character named Fred is mentioned at several points in the story, largely as an onlooker. No change to the story is noticed. Notes This will serve as a baseline for future effects of SCP-423. Dr. E. Mann Date Test Material The Hobbit by J. R. R. Tolkien Results A fourteenth dwarf named Faridor is a member of the party. The narrative is largely the same except that there is no references to a lucky number. Faridor is mentioned as surviving the Battle of Five Armies, but Oin is killed. Notes SCP-423's role is larger in its work, allowing a better look at its effects. The dialogue written for the character is similar to that written for the other dwarves. Other differences in text match Tolkien's writing style as used in the rest of the book. Dr. E. Mann Date Test Material Plain Journal Results There was no result for some time until one of the researchers wrote his name on the cover. The words, Hide There, appeared underneath. A conversation was held during which it was established that SCP-423 possessed both the ability and desire to communicate. Notes. This proves that SCP-423 is sentient. If it can be controlled, it can be useful in dealing with certain text-based SCPs. This bears further research. Dr. E. Mann Date. Test Material Dragon Quest by Anne McCaffrey Results. A minor blue writer named Fared appears in the story. No other changes are noted. Date Test Material Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince by J.K. Rowling Results A wizard named Fred appeared. Very few changes in the story are noted, except one scene in which SCP-423 is confused with an existing character in the series. Notes SCP-423 display paranormal abilities in the narrative, though nothing out of note for the fictional universe. However, when returned to the journal, SCP-423 said it couldn't duplicate them outside of that particular narrative universe. Dr. E. Mann Date Test Material Ulysses by James Joyce Results SCP-423 immediately returned to the journal, where it wrote out, Ow, ow, bad idea. Notes Note this is a potential punishment for SCP-423 if it misbehaves. Dr. E. Mann Date Test Material the Draco Tavern by Larry Niven Result, A new regular employee of the Draco Tavern showed up named Fred. Only mentioned in passing save in the story Cruel and Unusual, where he expressed sympathy for the Chirp Sithra view. Note, either he's not completely human in outlook, or only acts that way when dealing with stories of aliens. We should probably test this further. Dr. D. Bettier Date Test Material the Battle Hymn of the Republic by Julia Ward Howe Results, Verse 2 lines 1 and 3 altered, rather than, I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps, and, I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. The lines now state, Fred has seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps, and, Fred can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. Upon returning to the journal, SCP-423 wrote, That was interesting but I don't think I want to try it again. Date Test Material Mary Had a Little Lamb Verses 1 and 2 Only by Sarah Josepha Hale Results References to Mary in verse 1 are now references to Freddy. References to her in verse 2 are now references to him. 
Date Test Material Mary Had a Little Lamb Full Version by Sarah Josepha Hale Results Verses 1 and 2 are now unaltered. A reference to the eager children in verse 4 is now a reference to Fred and the children. Date Test Material House of Leaves Color Version by Mark Z. Danieluski Results A male man named Fred delivers a letter to Will Navinson and Paige. Fred also appears as a bartender that attends Johnny and one of the orderlies caring for Pelafina. SCP-423 expressed profound confusion after leaving this work. Of note is that all references of Fred in the text are written in green. Date Test Material Gatsby, Champion of Youth by Ernest Vincent Wright Gatsby is known for being an extended lipogram, a 50,110-word story written without any ease. Results, a minor character named Ford appeared in the novel. Date Test Material A non-pornographic limerick about a man from Nantucket. Results, no change. SCP-423 subsequently explained that the given limerick was too small and too tight, with insufficient flexibility. Date Test Material A book of 365 haiku. Results, Third line of thirteen separate haiku replaced with a five-syllable phrase mentioning Fred. Fred watched silently. Fred is also here. Only Fred remains, etc. Date Test Material The Frogs Who Desired a King by Aesop Written using plastic letters with a magnetic backing applied to a metallic surface. Results The penultimate sentence became a big stork that soon set to work gobbling them all up except for one named Fred who hid. The new letters appeared to be of the same material and design of the original ones, and the weight of the complete setup remained the same. Date Test Material Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy Results In the introductory scene where Holden incites a mob to murder the Reverend by falsely accusing the Reverend of rape and bestiality, a bystander named Frederick is present in the mob. However, instead of participating, the bystander leaves in disgust. The narrator comments that the weak coward Frederick was never seen again. Date Test Material Telephone Directory 2003 Results No Change Date Test Material Twelve Angry Men by Reginald Rose Results The list of characters specifies that the courthouse guard is named Fred. He is described as disappointed that he will be excluded from the jurors' deliberations. Date Test Material Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler, German Original Results No change for the first minutes, followed by an insertion of multiple brief references to a distant, skeptical colleague named Friedrich into autobiographical fragments of chapters 2 to 8 of the book. The inserts were in German, roughly consistent with the original style but containing a number of grammar and stylistic mistakes. Upon returning to the journal, SCP-423 remarked, Whew, that was hard. Note, I am not sure what is more significant here, that 423 appears to possess a native tongue, or that it was apparently able to obtain fairly good knowledge of German from the contents of a single book, even as long as this one. We should look deeper into its possible application to translating hitherto undecipherable scripts. Dr. Despair Date Test Material Odyssey by Homer English Braille Edition Results No Change SCP-423 left the book after five minutes, saying, Interesting, but I think I'll leave this one for when I'm really bored. Date Test Material A hard copy of this experiment log Results Identical except for the insertion of the words ruggedly handsome in several sections of the log. Date Test Material The Kugelmass Episode by Woody Allen A story about a man who is able to travel into fiction. Results Testing forbidden by O5 Date Test Material SCP-826 Using SCP-423 Communication Journal as a book. Results Testing forbidden by O5 Date Test Material SCP-701 Results Testing forbidden by O5 Date Test Material A Canadian $5 bill, 2008 issue. The reverse of the bill contained a two-sentence passage from The Hockey Sweater by Roche Carrier, 
in French and in English. Results. First sentence remained intact. Second sentence, which describes how important skating rinks were in Carrier's childhood, now mentions life on the skating rink with Fred. Sur la patinoire avec Fred. Notes. The bill was first tested in a change machine and accepted as legitimate. After SCP-423 left the bill, it was tested in the same chain machine and rejected as counterfeit. Date Test material Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss Results Halfway through the book, Sam I Am asked the protagonist, Would you eat them here with Fred? Would you eat them with some bread? The protagonist refuses. No edited nor additional illustrations were included. Notes. After returning to his journal, SCP-423 noted, That was fun. Date. Test Material The Fellowship of the Ring by J. R. R. Tolkien Result. A hobbit named Fredegar Burroughs, noted as a friend of Samwise Gamgee, accompanies Frodo Baggins and his party throughout the book. Notes. A particular note is that Oin, noted as having been killed in 423's version of The Hobbit, is mentioned as surviving in this book. Date. Test Material SCP-140 Results. Testing forbidden by O5 Note, Without permission, researcher who was working with SCP-140 at the time put the two books together, despite training and resisting mimetic effects. Words appearing rapidly on SCP-140's pages at a rate of roughly one page filled every twelve seconds until SCP-423 returned to his journal, and the words disappeared from the pages of SCP-140. SCP-423 later stated that it was extremely painful and felt like it was being ripped apart. Date. Test Material SCP-1425 Results Testing forbidden by O5 Date. Test Material SCP-1230 Results Pending O5 Approval Date. Test Material SCP-1195 Results Pending O5 approval. Testing forbidden by O5. Date. Test material. A list of Class D personnel to be terminated the first of the month. Names included. Results. The line Class D personnel to be decommissioned as of. Change to Class D personnel to be released as of. All names remain as first written down. SCP-423 writes in the journal. Now that's just heartless. Note. It is conclusive that SCP-423 has the ability to not only feel emotion, but has a belief in the importance of life. Date. Test Material A 20-minute ballet for eight dancers, four male and four female, described in Ruboff Labin's Labin Notation System for recording human movement. Results. Notation indicates that halfway through the ballet, a fifth male dancer walks on stage, looks at the other dancers, shrugs his shoulders and walks off. Date. Test material. A logic puzzle, as published in Logic Puzzle Magazine, describing how five different people took their driving test in five different vehicles on five different days and made five different errors, as is standard for logic puzzles of this sort. Solvers are to determine which student drove which vehicle and made which error on which day. Results. A driving examiner named Fred is mentioned as having been present during all tests. Upon subsequent questioning, SCP-423 was able to correctly state which driver made which error in which vehicle on which day. When asked how it knew this, SCP-423 did not explain the series of logical inferences, deductions, and conclusions by which such puzzles are typically solved, but rather simply stated that it was right there the whole time. Date. Test Material The Gardens of the Moon by Steven Erickson Results the Dramatis Personae in the start of the book now mentions Reader, a soldier in the Bridgeburners, and Fred, a Duro patron of the Phoenix Inn. In the second chapter, following the fall of Pale, the Bridgeburners that arrive for Hairlock include a fifth person, who is unnamed and doesn't speak, but can later be identified as Reader. In many subsequent encounters with the Bridgeburners, the soldier Reader is also present. This character doesn't have any lines and is normally found with a book in his hand. In Chapter 5 during Krupp's dream, Krupp sees a figure with the Gadrobi shantytown who, he says, greatly reminds him of his friend Fred, who he saw just the other day in the Phoenix Inn. From Chapter 6 on, 
Fred is to be found in the Phoenix Inn. Interestingly, for the garden party at Lady Samtil's estate, both Fred and Reader are guests. Bridgeburner and Darrow viewpoint characters alike comment on how they look vaguely similar. Apart from the minor changes, the book has exactly the same ending as before, though. Upon returning to the journal, SCP-423 wrote only dot 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 when questioned. After a few minutes, it finally wrote sorry, that was interesting but exhausting. SCP-423 expressed an interest in the remaining books of the series. This has been noted and will be considered as a reward for good behavior. Notes. This has proven that 423 can be in multiple places within the same narrative, although it seems to tire it out. Dr. R. Karma Date. Test Material Candidate Multilinear Maps by Sanjem Garg Published in 2013 as a doctoral thesis Results. Approximately 10 seconds after entering, SCP-423 returned to the journal and wrote, Sorry, not enough room for me. Notes. It seems that 423 needs to have a narrative to work off. This has been noted for the future. Dr. R. Karma Date Test Material A printout of source code for a simple Hello World program in C-sharp. Results The source code now has a number of additional comments alongside the source code professing confusion about certain aspects of programming. On returning to the journal, SCP-423 wrote out, Well, that was a first. Date Test Material Head First C Sharp, 3rd Edition First Printing by Andrew Stellman and Jennifer Green. Results A number of examples involving named male characters have had these characters renamed to Fred. The puzzles are all filled in. Around page 100 or so, notes start appearing here and there. No substantial changes are noted until page 698, where a typo identified in the errata for the book was corrected. In subsequent pages, a number of typos and language problems were corrected in code snippets and descriptions, matching the errors reported in the errata, with the exceptions of screenshots. On returning to the journal, SCP-423 reported that it found that fun but unusual. On being questioned on its understanding of the language, SCP-423 stated that it could write and understand C-sharp, and expressed a desire to use Visual Studio. Notes. 423 seems to be both capable and interested in learning, provided that there is some narrative reason for it to learn. A potential future experiment could involve its attempting to decant it into a computer without an internet connection. Dr. R. Karma Date. Test Material Secret of the Ninja Choose Your Own Adventure No. 16 by J. Liebold Results. The viewpoint character is initially accompanied by a character named Fred, who is another student at the dojo. Several of the choice descriptions which lead to a negative ending for the protagonist and his companions are changed to contain a phrase indicating Fred does not accompany the protagonist. Note, 423 does not seem significantly hindered by the book's branching narrative, nor by the presence of multiple endings. Researcher Date 2015 Test Material Printed copy of an ASCII art rendition of the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci Results all punctuation used to simulate the shading of the original work is replaced with the letters F, R, E, and D in upper and lower case. Note, when questioned about the extent of its ability to completely modify textual representations of imagery, as opposed to merely substituting characters, SCP-423 acknowledged the possibility, responding with, I guess so, maybe, but I'm not really good at art. Further inquiry is suggested. Date. Test Material SCP-085 Results Pending O5 Approval Date. Test Material The Frequently Asked Questions Document for the Usenet News Group Alt.Objective.Noun.Verb.Verb.Verb Results A sentence is added to the section of the document which describes the news group's genesis, stating Alt.anomalous.fred.perplex.baffled.moderately-amused Date Test Material Lion Eating Poet in the Stone Den by Yuan Ren Chao Lion Eating Poet is a 92-character poem written in classical Chinese in which every syllable is pronounced she, albeit with varying tones. Results SCP-423-D manifested from its journal but did not manifest within the test document. 
After ten minutes, researchers were about to report a containment breach, when SCP-423 re-manifested within its journal, stating it had gotten lost trying to find a way in. Date. World War Z by Max Brooks The book consists of multiple small interview-like stories told from the perspective of survivors of a zombie apocalypse. Results. SCP-423 demanifested from the journal, and was discovered to have added in the accounts of a character named Fred, who survived in a bookstore on Road in New York. A team has been dispatched to investigate the named location. Date. Test Material Marvel Masterworks The X-Men Vol. 1 by Stan Lee Writer and Jack Kirby Artist The book is a trade paperback collection of the first ten issues of the comic book series The X-Men. The collection now contains numerous references to Fred Wordsworth, one of the students of Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. This character is described as a mutant possessing the ability to physically enter and alter any text but that this power has made him invisible and intangible. By issue number 5, the character has become a second-string member of the X-Men unit under the alias Bookworm. The character indirectly participates in several plot points through utilization of his abilities, in one instance distracting a villain by altering nearby signs. Notes, SCP-423 was found to have altered certain instances of text within the artwork, but was completely unable to affect other instances upon request. Investigation has revealed that all susceptible text was added by the comic's letterer, exclusively responsible for the addition of all text found in the comic, rather than the inker, exclusively responsible for finalizing artwork. Further study is recommended. Date. Test Material The Poem Incident by Count T. Cullen, depicting Cullen's experiences with anti-black racism as a child visiting Baltimore. Result. The ninth line of the poem is changed from, I saw the whole of Baltimore, to Fred showed me all of Baltimore. Notes, SCP-423 seems reluctant to portray itself as either the perpetrator or the victim of racism. Date. Test Material Slaughterhouse-5 by Kurt Vonnegut The novel is a semi-autobiographical account of Vonnegut's experience as an American prisoner of war during the 1945 bombing of Dresden, Germany during World War II. Result, all mention of Kurt Vonnegut within the novel, excluding within the foreword, is altered to describe SCP-423, such as, that was I, that was me, that was the author of this book, was changed to read, that was Fred, that was not me, that was not the author of this book. Notes, as Kurt Vonnegut himself was not mentioned for most of the novel, he could technically be described as a minor character. Date. Test Material The Outsiders by S. E. Hinton Results, A new member of the Sox accompanies Robert during the scene in which Robert is murdered. When Pony Boy wakes up after having attempted to be drowned, Johnny mentions that someone, unimpressively handsome, had introduced himself as Fred, before punching Johnny in the face, then running out of there like lightning. After returning to the journal, SCP-423 remarked, I know that you guys record this, and I didn't want to ruin the ending for anyone who hadn't read the book. It is to be noted that at the end of the book, Date Test Material Fred's Story by Researcher Torres, a small novella written specifically to test SCP-423's abilities. The novella is set in a fantasy kingdom whose inhabitants are all beautiful women. When the kingdom is attacked by a demonic force, the Kingdom's Queen creates a ritual to summon a hero from another dimension to save them. The hero is never given a name, but it is mentioned that he is male and can transfer his consciousness to different works of fiction. Result, the hero is left nameless, and the novella is left unchanged, aside from an added sentence in Chapter 2 which mentions that one of the Queen's assistants is named Frederica. After SCP-423 demanifested from the novella, it noted, I appreciate the offer, but I just can't. I never deserved to be in the spotlight. Date. Test Material The Last Question by Isaac Asimov This test was conducted not using physically printed material, but a 9.7-inch e-reader tablet utilizing electronic paper technology. Electronic paper is able to retain a static image indefinitely without electricity, requiring power only for the initial rendering. Image remains as a suspension of pigments in an oil-like base once rendered, 
Entire story was rendered on a single screen in a small font. Wireless functionality was disabled before testing by physically severing circuit traces on the device's printed circuit board as a precaution. Result, a character named FR-33D is inserted into the third section of the story almost instantaneously, with a single line in response to another character's comment on the rate at which humans are populating the galaxy. SCP-423 stated afterwards, Good story, but what was that? It felt strange. It was very easy to move through. Not at all unpleasant. It felt like there was something below the story, if that makes sense. Can we do more like that? Notes. It is unclear whether SCP-423 moved through the internal circuitry of the device or is simply the physical pigment and oil suspension of the electronic paper material. Changes occurred much faster than in tests with ink on paper. Recommend further testing with other subtraits and form factors. Electronic paper appears to be close enough to printed material as to be compatible with SCP-423. What else might be compatible? Text painted on a wall? Stitched into fabric? Written on a cake with icing? Doctor? Date. Test material. If on a winter's night a traveler, by Italo Calvino. English translation by William Weaver. A metafictional novel about interrupted and unfinished narratives half of whose content is a second-person narrative describing a reader's increasingly frantic attempts to obtain and read a copy of If on a Winter Night a Traveler, only to find that every copy is flawed such that every other chapter is from a different imaginary novel, and that other half is the aforementioned chapters from imaginary novels. Results. In the section where the protagonist angrily returns the flawed copy of the novel to the bookseller in hopes of either attaining a proper copy or finding out the conclusion to the chapter of the imaginary novel, another angry customer named Fred tells the bookseller that, if this is a joke, it's not funny. Date. Test Material A version of In Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust, English translation by D.J. Enright, considered one of the longest works of fiction in history, in which all seven volumes have been custom-bound into one book, with all indications of differing volumes removed. Results. After several minutes, Fred only appears within the first three volumes, Swan's Way, In the Shadow of Young Girls and Flower, and The Garamont's Way, before all references of him cease. Upon return to the journal, SCP-423 expressed feelings of surprise, stating, Great story, but I took a peek of how long it went and wow is it long. I'm going to need to come back to this one. Notes. Along with the aforementioned Erickson test, this could be an indicator that SCP-423 has an upper limit as to the length of the works he can manifest in. Date. Test Materials SCP-3450 Printed on the standard computer paper Results. Testing forbidden by O5 Notes. SCP-423 had learned of this test after denial due to junior researcher accidentally leaving a notepad expressing disappointment at the test denial near 423's journal. SCP-423 wrote that, the irony of interacting with a self-insert fanfic isn't lost on me. Date. Test Material Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck Results. A character named Freddy appears multiple times throughout the book, working as a farmhand on the ranch. The narrator describes him as, a man whose handsomeness is all the more apparent when compared to the other hands at the ranch, as he is not nearly as worn down. His largest appearance is during the section when George Milton and Lenny Small first arrive on the ranch. As he passes the two protagonists by, he comments on the size of Lenny, remarking that he looks like a bull who learned how to walk on his hind legs. Date. Test Material 300 Children's Building Block Toys Result. No change. Notes. The result of this test is rather inconclusive. Did SCP-423 consider the letters on the blocks a picture instead of text? Could it only affect one block and not have enough room? Or can it simply not affect this form of writing? More tests like this will have to be conducted. Date. Test Material SCP-2236 SCP-2236 was used to examine tests known to have been affected by SCP-423. Result. First few texts examined exhibited no change. In subsequently examined text, references to SCP-423 in the text were, when examined using SCP-2236, 
interpreted as descriptions of Fred seeking to hide or observe observation. When returned to the journal, a comment in appeared in the journal reading, that was rude. This comment, when examined using SCP-2236, appeared as a string of expletives. Date. Test material. A journal with, Mary had a little lamb, but written in invisible ink. Result. Same as the last time, Mary had a little lamb was used. SCP-423 manifested itself in invisible ink. When asking SCP-423 if he noticed the change in ink, he did admit that the document seemed slightly different. Note, it seems that SCP-423 might be able to know specific patterns and differences between text, explaining his adherence to story-specific restrictions. This is confirmed by this experiment. Date Test material A copy of the Voynich Manuscript Result, After five minutes in which the text did not change, SCP-423 explained that the topic was technical up to a level where SCP-423 could not understand. Though SCP-423 explained it did seem that the pictures in the Voynich manuscript matched the captions below. Date. Test material. A hard copy of the Wikipedia page on the Poincaré conjecture. Result. The only place where SCP-423 manifested was in one of the bibliographies. SCP-423 stated that it could not find a good place to appear due to the lack of knowledge of the Poincaré conjecture, though it was impressed by Poincaré's math skills. Date. Test material. Metaphors by Sylvia Plath, a nine-line poem in which each line is a nine-syllable metaphor for the same subject. Result: No change. When SCP-423 returned to his journal, it stated that whatever she's doing in there, it's too crowded. There's no room for me. I really don't think I should be in there. It's kind of private. And refused to comment further. Date. Test material. A copy of the film script for Inception by Christopher Nolan. Result: SCP-423 appeared as a minor character appearing in some of the dreams, as well as the limbo state for the movie. It adhered to the capitalization format of the script, Fred, as well as his name put in the middle of the page when appearing, with a line after his name each time. SCP-423 states that it highly enjoyed the script, though he was a bit confused by Fade Out as well as credits since this was the first time it was exposed to a movie script. Date. Test material. A copy of the script for Heaven Sent from Doctor Who. Result. References to sculptures on the wall resembling SCP-423's usual look. SCP-423 explained that the tight story made it too difficult for him to manifest himself as an actual character, though he vastly enjoyed the Doctor's fantastic performance, which he claimed he experienced not at four billion years but only an hour, as long as a TV episode. Notes. It seems that if a story is very contained, any other characters would have a severe change in plot or make no sense. With only a bare minimal amount of main characters, SCP-423 will become an inanimate object in the story instead, though still aware of events occurring. Date. Test material. The lyrics to Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. Result. In verses 2 and 3, Mama was replaced by Frederica. SCP-423 seemed unaware that this was from a song as opposed to a poem. It seems that not all information is given to SCP-423, merely enough for him to not interrupt the flow of a poem or song, as well as fulfill any standards set by a story. Date. Test Material Fifty Shades of Grey by E. L. James Result. A minor character, Fred, appeared in the background. SCP-423 expressed that it was a bit uncomfortable with the explicit scenes within the book and requested that it be sent to stories with more adventure and action next time. Notes. It seems that SCP-423 also has a taste for specific books. This is the first time it was exposed to a sexually explicit book, so it was not used to the situation. Date. Test Material This is the title of this story which is also found several times in the story itself by David Moser, a metafictional story about self-reference. Result: Several additional sentences appear throughout the story, including, this is the sentence in which Fred appears, this is not the sentence in which Fred appears, and this sentence alludes to Fred's presence but does not actually contain Fred. Date: Test material. Written by Dr. 
a list of 100 fictional people doing things simultaneously in different areas, with a tragic end, along with a final over-encompassing statement about each of them contributing to the tragedy. Result. This test was to determine if there was an upper limit to how many locations SCP-423 could reside in at the same time within a book. Out of 100 fictional people, only 83 had the mention of Fred with it. The tragedy was not prevented in the end. SCP-423 noted that it got too tired of being at 83 different places in the story. Date. Test Material The File for SCP-055 Result Inconclusive SCP-423 stated that it was not sure what it was doing other than the fact that something was not spherical. Researchers soon forgot what they sent SCP-423 to do. Date. Test Material The experimental data for SCP-2719, labeled SCP-2719, with no outcomes listed, and with an additional entry with SCP-423 at the bottom, also with no outcome listed. Result. The data was filled precisely identical to the real file of SCP-2719. SCP-423's outcome was became inside. When questioned, SCP-423 responded that it merely observed what occurred with each entity, despite SCP-2719 being an abstract metaphysical concept. It also somehow experienced becoming inside, despite having no knowledge of 2719. More testing to be done with 2719 and 423. Notes. It seems that abstract entities manifesting themselves have the same effect on SCP-423 as any usual person, even if SCP-423 has no idea of what is happening. It also seems it can fill in the blanks based on what already happened. Date. Test Material Experiment Log 914 Part 2 Result. A record appeared in Test Logs, Part 8 of an experiment performed by guest researcher Fred, with the rest of the data for said experiment blocked out. Date Total Date Failure Test Material The Abridged History of Homo Sapiens by History Analysis Subroutine No. 7589-3723572864-73-NFIZ SCP-423 is featured under the Unknown Period section as a featureless humanoid screaming in an infinite white void and rambling incoherently. After being returned, SCP-423 showed signs of prolonged exposure to weak time, suggesting that SCP-423 still understands temporal physics in a manner similar to organic beings. Date. Test Material An untitled 50,000-page story created by randomization bound by grammar and basic sentence structure created for this test. Result. The sentence, Joshua went to the diagonal party without a safety ant, was replaced with, Joshua went to the diagonal party without a safety Fred. Notes. SCP-423 noted that being in the document was similar to when it has experienced dreams and other stories which it slept. Date. Test material. A printout of the game script for The Secret of Monkey Island. Result was laser scanned and the raw text compiled into a working program after being screened for anomalies. Result, an NPC named Fred appears near the small building at the pier on Melee Island. When spoken to, the player is presented with a dialogue tree. Questioning him on his backstory reveals that he tried and failed to become a pirate. It is mandatory to recruit him on the ship's crew for the second chapter, where he joins the mutiny. Subsequent cutscenes have him present with the rest of the crew. Notes. Upon returning to the journal, SCP-423 remarked, That was like a choose-your-own-adventure book. Let me know if you find any more. Date. Test material. A million random digits with 100,000 normal deviants. Published by Rand Corporation 1955. Result. Addition of a preface by Dr. Frederick McCarthy. Explaining the statistical methodology used to generate the numbers in the book. Date. Test Material The Location 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 Story Arc from the first print collection of Precocious Precocious is a webcomic where all characters are anthropomorphic animals. However, none of the dialogue in this particular story states or implies a species. The purpose of this test is to determine if SCP-423 can sense artwork. Results. Mr. Krupp states the name of the father in an off-screen family to be named Fred. Upon returning to the journal, 
SCP-423 was asked if the cast of this story were human. SCP-423 states that they were animals, and he himself took on the form of an arctic fox. Further questioning reveals that this was the most nondescript species of the choices he was given. Date. Test material. The entire script of William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Results. During Act 1, Scene 2, a character by the name of Frederick sneezes halfway through King Claudius' speech. Hamlet laughs. No other changes have been discovered. Notes. When questioned, SCP-423 stated, I got a little bored during the speech. Date. Test material. SCP-1459 Extended Testing Log. Results. No change. Notes. SCP-423 stated the following. You all disgust me. So. Fucking. Much. Item number SCP-826 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-826 is to be kept in a 25cm by 25cm safe with a numerical keypad lock. The combination for the lock will be given only to those with Level 2 clearance and will be changed on a weekly basis. Description: SCP-826 is a 20cm by 15cm pair of bookends, molded in the shape of two outward-facing dragon heads. Scrapings from the surface of SCP-826 revealed a composition of 99% tin, 0.5% copper, 0.3% antimony, and 0.2% lead, consistent with high-grade pewter. However, it is unclear whether SCP-826 is solid pewter or whether the pewter is merely a plating for some unknown element, which gives the SCP its properties. When a subject places a book between SCP-826, touching both ends, and leaves the room, SCP-826 will, in an instantaneous process, convert the interior of whatever room it is currently located in, a room defined as an enclosed area into the setting of the contained book. Any form of entry into the room will instead open into a random location within the book setting. During this transformation process, SCP-826, along with the contained book, will relocate to another part of the book setting, showing a preference for places where books are normally found – libraries, studies, etc. To reverse the effects of SCP-826, a subject must remove the book from SCP-826, then exit whatever room SCP-826 was found in. The subject will find themselves outside the original room of SCP-826's containment, while SCP-826's containment room will be restored to normal. In addition, the subject will find themselves at a random temporal location in the book's plot, ranging from the beginning to near the end of the book. If the subject does not find SCP-826 within the setting before the end of the book, SCP-826 will reset the setting, starting the book's plot over. The subject will then be incorporated into the book as a background character, losing all memories of a previous life outside of SCP-826. Researchers studying SCP-826 are advised to enter the results into Experiment Log-826. Experiment Log 826 Experiment Logs are requested to be written in the following format. Head Researcher Subject Material Equipment Results Addendum Optional Head Researcher Doctor Subject Agent Book Little House on the Prairie Equipment One GPS Locator One Two-Way Radio one canteen filled with water, one watch, one 9mm semi-automatic with extra cartridges. Results. Upon entry into the affected area, all communications and transmissions immediately ceased. After a period of five minutes, Agent emerged from the door unharmed. Agent 
was dropped in the middle of a prairie with a green smudge off to the west, presumably the Verdigris River of the book. Agent walked towards the river for approximately an hour before coming across the individual claiming to be Charles Ingalls, who invited him for dinner. Agent accompanied Ingalls back to his home, a log cabin in the prairie, where he met the rest of his family and discovered SCP-826 sitting on the mantelpiece. When Agent pointed out SCP-826 to the family, they claimed SCP-826 was not there before, but did not appear concerned about its presence. Agent then ate dinner with the family, and afterwards asked if he could take the SCP-contained book with him. The family allowed him to take the book. Agent proceeded to remove the book from SCP-826 and exit through the cabin door into the research team's room. Display time on watch is consistent with Agent report that he had spent several hours in the setting. Addendum. Examination of the affected copy of the book reveals an additional paragraph in the book's midsection, describing Agent Visit. In language consistent with Laurel Ingalls Wilder's style. No mention is made, however, of SCP-826. Agent is simply described as having dinner and leaving. The textual deviation is unique to the affected copy of the book. Subject Agent Movie The Shining DVD Equipment One GPS locator One two-way radio One canteen filled with water One watch One 9mm semi-automatic with extra cartridges One video camera attached to Agent's hat Results. After Agent entered SCP-containing room, GPS and radio proceeded to malfunction as in previous experiment. After roughly 30 seconds, Agent exited the room and gave video camera to research team. Tape was playable and contained the following footage. Agent enters into a hotel room from what appeared to be a closet and, after exploring the room and confirming she could not exit through the closet, leaves the room. Agent continues down hallway, and eventually arrives in hotel lobby. Agent explores behind front desk and enters hotel manager's office, where SCP-826 sits on shelf beside hotel ledgers. Agent removes DVD from SCP-826 and exits through office door into research room. Addendum. Examination of DVD copy revealed no major plot deviations most likely due to the fact Agent did not interact with any of the characters. Experiment demonstrates that SCP-826 can work on DVDs as well as books. Subject, Agent Book The Mammoth's Book of Comic Fantasy A Collection of Short Stories Equipment One canteen filled with water One watch One 9mm semi-automatic with extra cartridges one video camera attached to Agent's headset. Note, use of GPS locator and two-way radio discontinued, due to their uselessness in previous tests. Results. Agent returned after seven minutes, having experienced and recorded just over nine hours. Examination of the recorded footage reveals that the agent experienced a portion of the short story The Eye of Tandala and was forced to defend himself from temple guards, killing two. This caused the alarm to be raised, and though Agent was able to retrieve the book from a temple library and escape, the protagonists were apparently caught and executed. The altered copy of the book now reflects his change, although the cause of the alarm is not mentioned, with other stories remaining unaltered. It should also be noted that the book now contains seven fewer pages than a standard unaltered copy. Dr. Blank requests that further experiments be performed with books of short stories, to determine whether the entire book will be experienced or just a single story, if the book is not recovered from SCP-826 before the story's end. Head Researcher Dr. Edison Subject Agent Book The Sword That Shoots Laser Beams When You Swing It A three-page short story written by Dr. Edison the story consists of a poetic description of a sword that shoots laser beams when swung. The story states it stands on a pedestal as thousands of years pass uneventfully. Equipment One canteen filled with water One watch 
one video camera attached to agent's headset. Results. Subject is instructed to retrieve the aforementioned sword, test its magical properties, and then bring it out. Subject enters door, and returns five minutes later with the original story, and sword testing proved that sword, when swung in an arc greater than 45 degrees, emits a beam of radiation consistent with the output of a CO2 laser. Sword has since been assigned to Dr. Edison for further study, to determine energy source, laser medium, and optical resonators. Video logs showed the sword in question matched textual descriptions, including the ability to shoot laser beams, and that Agent did indeed bring the sword with him. The story itself remains unchanged, except for a paragraph about a man matching Agent description stealing the sword and taking it to parts unknown. Sword has been dubbed SCP-826-1. Addendum. Scientific testing has proven inconclusive. Molecular analysis shows that SCP-826-1 has a molecular structure consistent with laser printer paper, the medium original story was printed on, yet behaves like high-grade steel in all other respects. The laser beam, on the other hand, acts like a CO2 laser in all respects but speed, which is clocked at a mere 60 km per hour far slower than conventional lasers. Attempts to collect its energy have proven futile, as energy dissipates within seconds regardless of hitting a target. A further note, Agent has come under the delusion that he is a man named Galthor from the Kingdom of Zolgorn. Agent has insisted on the return of SCP-826-1 to his homeland, and to be released from whatever foul sorcery he has been placed under. All attempts at treatment have proven futile. Dr. Edison requests that all further testing with SCP-826 is to be done by D-Class subjects. Addendum 2 At precisely on exactly 72 hours from Agent last trip into SCP-826, Agent and SCP-826-1 simultaneously disappeared. No trace had been found of the two and Agent's existence has been stripped from all Foundation records, including backup copies. The story used in the test in all aspects identical, barring a mention that the man's name was Galthor. Once again, Dr. Edison suggests that further testing of SCP-826 is to be done by D-Class subjects. Subject D-826-01 Book the Sword That Shoots Laser Beams When You Swing It, a three-page short story written by Dr. Edison, same copy that resulted from previous test, alterations and all. Equipment: One canteen filled with water, one watch, one video camera attached to subject's headset, one police issue X-26 taser, loaded. Results: Subject is asked to retrieve agent. Subject does not return after five minutes. Agent enters SCP-826 and retrieves the story without incident. Story now has additional details on a man in strange garb trying to stop Agent with a magic weapon hereby unknown to man, which matches the description of X-26 Police Taser. Story then describes Agent injuring D-826-01 with SCP-826-01 before locking him in the foulest of dungeons in Castle Hyleth. Recovered footage confirms incident. Subject D-826-02 D-826-03 D-826-04 D-826-05 D-826-06 and D-826-07 all of whom have military training. Book: The Sword That Shoots Laser Beams When You Swing It A three-page short story written by Dr. Edison. Same copy that resulted from previous test. Equipment: Six canteens filled with water, six watches, six video cameras attached to subjects' headsets, six police issue X-26 tasers, loaded. Results. Subjects given successfully apprehend Agent and D-826-01, 
leaving SCP-826-01 behind. Story acknowledges all changes, describing six rogues who clamored to avenge the blood of their fallen brother, capturing Agent Addendum. Agent still experiencing pathological delusions, and remains convinced that he is a knight named Galthor. Likewise, DA-26-01 claims to be a blood wizard named Rothmorn, seeking to claim SCP-826-01 to himself. DA-26-01's X-26 taser has turned into a magic staff capable of shooting lightning and is hypothesized to have physical properties similar to SCP-826-01. Item has been labeled SCP-826-02, and has been sent to site for further testing. Also, subjects DA-26-02, DA-26-03, DA-26-04, DA-26-05, DA-26-06, and DA-26-07 are now claiming to be Knights of the Throne sent to aid Galthor. Addendum 2 As in the previous experiment, Agent Subjects DA-26-02, DA-26-03, DA-26-04, DA-26-05, DA-26-06, and DA-26-07 and SCP-826-02 disappeared at on again exactly 72 hours from exiting SCP-826. Story now says that Galthor was indeed accompanied by six Knights of the Throne, who were armed with arcane weapons given to them by the good wizard Edison Grad. All researchers that have been handling SCP-826-02 or SCP-826 are accounted for. Further monitoring of researchers handling objects from SCP-826 is recommended. Okay, seriously, how did that thing know my name? I'm sure I didn't tell it to either of the agents, and I'm damn sure I didn't tell any of the subjects. I know this turns up so much in our line of work that it's kinda cliché, but I think the thing might just be sentient. Dr. Edison Head Researcher Dr. Aaron Torres Subject D-87631 Material A copy of A Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin Equipment One military-grade saber Results The purpose of the test was to determine how significantly SCP-826 will allow alterations to the main storyline. Test subject was instructed to disembowel the first person it saw in the work. Upon entering, Subject found itself in a circular room, alone with the character Lord Eddard Stark, who was unarmed. Subject attempted to stab Stark, but tripped and fell before he could do so. Subject recovered and tried multiple times to approach Stark, but tripped on multiple inconveniently placed objects. Subject eventually managed to stab Stark, but apparently only gave a minor wound. Subject retreated from the room and eventually found a book in a library within the castle. Upon retrieval, the text itself had not been significantly altered. The only recorded changes to the text were multiple new paragraphs regarding an attempt on Stark's life by quote, a rather unintelligent and bumbling assassin, unquote. Presumably, SCP-826 will adjust settings and events in minor ways to prevent major changes to the work's core continuity. Head Researcher Dr. King Subject D-48279 Material The Odd Couple by Neil Simon Equipment One head-mounted camera Results Subject arrived in a landscape consistent with Pioneer-era America. He encounters a man traveling down a road, matching historical descriptions of Jonathan Chapman, who greets the subject and continues walking. Subject sees SCP-826 in the branches of a nearby tree, then returns to the testing chamber through a passage in the hollow of said tree. The book originally placed in SCP-826 is found to have been replaced with a modified copy of Johnny Appleseed by Rosemary Carr Binet. Head Researcher Dr. Praetorius Subject D-21094 
Material Death by the Book by Juliana Deering Equipment One canteen filled with water One watch One video camera attached to test subject's headset Results Upon entering, the test subject returned after 15 minutes. After interviewing the subject and reviewing the footage, it was discovered that the beginning of the novel was the first location found by the subject, being the murder scene that is investigated by the main characters and sets the stage for the remainder of the book. The characters, being from a 1930s period piece, reacted inquisitively to the D-Class's alien clothing and behavior, but did not impede the subject's examination of the surroundings. In fact, at one point the investigator, Chief Inspector Birdsong, interpreted the orange jumpsuit worn by the subject as meaning they were from the coroner's office, and encouraged them to wait nearby until he would finish examining the crime scene. It was at this time that video showed the murder weapon used in the crime and sitting next to the body, originally written as a marble bookend shaped like a bust of William Shakespeare, was in fact one half of SCP-826. The novel that had been entered was lying on the floor roughly halfway between the murder weapon and the other half of SCP-826. The test subject immediately retrieved the novel, despite the protest of the characters, and exited the novel before they could react. Upon examination, the novel now contained an additional character to the first chapter, described as an quote, opportunistic thief, unquote, who took advantage of the crime scene to quote, pilfer the belongings of the deceased, unquote. Of special note is that the murder weapon was now a, quote, handsome bookend of particular high quality, unquote. This is the first reported incident of SCP-826 integrating itself into the plot of a novel. It might be an indicator of sentience, or merely the narrative taking advantage of the fact that the SCP is identical to an item already in the novel. More testing is suggested. Item number SCP-1024 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-1024 is kept in a secure locker at Reliquary Containment Site-76, under standard Level 3 bibliomorphic containment conditions. Access to SCP-1024 is prohibited, without Level 3 authorization. Personnel assigned to researching SCP-1024 have standing authorization for access, but must inform their project leader before accessing SCP-1024, and must log all activity related to its use. Description: SCP-1024 is a modified Dungeons & Dragons basic box set, published circa 1981, in nearly new condition, consisting of a rulebook, a module, a pre-printed adventure, a catalog, a set of dice, and a crayon. Although SCP-1024 superficially resembles a standard box set sold at the time, the rule book and module have had their pages removed and replaced with sheets of vellum and bound using platinum staples. The pages are filled with diagrams and text written in classical Latin using red ink, and the books smell faintly of sulfur. Together, the two books provide basic information from which one can, with sufficient study and practice, invoke a variety of low-power anomalous effects. The rulebook, designated SCP-1024-01, is 64 pages long and contains general information regarding invoking these effects, including the types of material to be used and why, how to choose and prepare a location for invoking these effects, how to prepare the cell beforehand, and steps to take in case something goes wrong. SCP-1024-01 does not include procedures for invoking any specific effect, however. The module, designated SCP-1024-02, is 32 pages long and contains step-by-step -step instructions for invoking a variety of effects, based on information found in SCP-1024-01. Anomalous effects that have been successfully invoked using procedures found in SCP-1024-02 include 
creating a protective circle. SCP-1024-01 notes that invoking this circle is recommended before performing any other process. Changing superficial traits on an object, such as its color or roughness. Changing the ambient temperature slightly, generally by no more than 5 degrees Celsius. Repairing minor damage an object has sustained. Healing minor injuries. Causing a short-lived tactile effect on another person, such as an itch or a tickle. Reading the surface thoughts of another person for brief periods. Causing a small animal, no larger than a mouse, to spontaneously appear. The books imply that stronger effects can be invoked using information that can be found in a different, more advanced set of books. However, no such volumes have yet been found. The remaining components of SCP-1024, the catalog, dice, crayon, and box, do not appear to have any anomalous properties. Item number SCP-592 Object Class Euclid Special Container Procedures SCP-592 should be contained in Research Cell 1611-E at all times, locked in a steel box, in the middle of a frosted glass containment cubicle. Also in the cubicle are a table, two computers, a standard-sized computer scanner, an internal network connection port, and two pairs of visual distortion goggles, which must be worn upon entering the cubicle, so as to make SCP-592 illegible. The first, computer serves as a, the first computer serves as an analyst machine, the second as a custom firewall. All devices have been modified with specialized software and hardware see testing protocol for details, and the network port has been secured such that no device other than the firewall may use it. It is strictly necessary that the computers and scanner are turned off and unplugged after experimenting, and that they are only powered for the duration of the experiment. The front and back covers of SCP-592 are to be covered in black opaque tape at all times. The cell must be guarded continually to ensure that SCP-592 is not removed. Description. SCP-592 is a large hardcover book which exhibits no external qualities that could be considered unusual, but which can cause delusions, psychosis, changes in physical health and appearance, or even severe wounding when read. It is titled Chronicle of the Twentieth Century and consists of 450 all-color printed pages. It is reported that it has a printed cover, no dust jacket, with the title of the book the publisher, and a selection of illustrations from within the text. The original cover is a deep blue. The spine contains the title and publisher name, and is left uncovered by tape. The covered page informs the reader that it was published by Interworld Press, 54 Street, Chicago, Illinois, in 1996. A company named Interworld Press has never been registered in the U.S nor does the street listed exist. The text is a collection of newspaper clippings and short articles on major events from January 1900 to December 1995. Much of the first half of the text agrees with recorded events, but at some point no later than June 15, 1956, a date researchers have termed the Point of Divergence, or POD, the text begins to diverge from known history. These divergences become more common and acute the further away from the P.O.D. the text is. Subjects reading from the text before the P.O.D. report no ill effects, and generally comment that the text is well written and seems very accurately researched. Subjects reading from the book after the P.O.D. understand the passage read as accepted truth, and vehemently deny any suggestions that the text is in fact incorrect. The claims subjects make are often disturbing or shocking in nature. It also appears that a subject that has read passages from a certain year can recount events that are detailed in later sections of the book. It has been found that those born before the date which the text passage indicates and lived in or nearby the location of the event described 
may construct personal experiences built around the event, and describe them as they would any other vivid memory. The subject will go on to great measures to defend the reality of their story, often turning violent if under interrogation. Exposure to SCP-592 may alter physical characteristics of the subject to conform with the events of the passage being read. This can vary from small changes in appearance or clothing to the infliction of severe wounds. For example, in one instance, a subject, D-94920, produced a scar during an interview, stating that he, quote, picked it up during the, unquote. His widow, when presented with the scar, located on his, was surprised, stating she, quote, had not noticed the scar before, unquote. It has been found that once the subject discovers that the world is inconsistent with their acquired memories, they begin to feel that the present reality is an illusion, a dream, or a deceit, often stating malevolent or government forces are at work in maintaining the illusion. Subjects who reach this stage enter into a profound and chronic psychosis. All attempts to treat this delusion have failed. The exact effects vary. Data passage read. Effects. Before POD. No ill short or long-term effects. Less than two months after POD. Short-term. Confusion. No ill long-term effects. Less than two years after POD. Short-term. Confusion. Long-term. Minor mental illness. Development of tics. Nightmares. Minor paranoia episodes and panic attacks. Less than ten years after POD. Short-term. Confusion. Violent episodes. Long-term. Deeply ingrained delusion formed, leading to debilitating paranoia, psychosis, and schizophrenia-type disorders. Less than ten years after POD, or earlier, if subject forms a personal experience. Short-term. Confusion. Violent episodes. Long-term. Acute psychosis and delusions. Crippling agnosia. Becomes withdrawn. High chance of suicidal or homicidal behavior. Severe risk of immediate but variable physical change in subject. SCP-592 was recovered during a narcotics raid in August of 2006 on the property of Mr. The leader of a controversial religious group called the Church of the True History. Despite being in possession of SCP-592, Mr. is believed to have started the church for financial gain, rather than revelation. The owner may have only survived exposure from SCP-592 for almost two years because of his rampant drug use, which included methamphetamine, cocaine, and a host of opioids, though psychedelics, especially DMT, are known to have been used and probably interacted with the effects of SCP-592 more than the others. Believed that his delusions came from his drug use, but noted that a year after exposure to SCP-592, he found himself turning to drugs more often to hide away from the truth. In custody, and deprived of his usual chemical relief, the suspect became comatose and died a week later. The circumstances of the acquisition had led to proposals to test SCP-592 in combination with psychedelic drugs. See Proposal Addendum 592-A The chemical properties of SCP-592 have been studied by Dr. Grayson and the chemical forensics team. Dr. Grayson reports that Samples were obtained by means of cutting small squares of paper from the book, while wearing distortion goggles. The squares were small enough to contain no more than one word. Squares containing portions of illustrations were covered by black opaque tape as soon as extracted. Our results indicate that the chemical properties of SCP-592 differ very little from any other color publication. The paper primarily consists of cellulose from common wood, and the black and yellow inks are standard. It has been found, however, that some chemicals used in the cyan and magenta inks, while entirely known to science, are not normally used in the industry. An expert in inks and dyes has commented that the chemicals would be an inferior but acceptable substitute to those currently in use if certain metal elements were much scarcer, and therefore much more expensive, than they are today. 
Testing Protocol SCP-592 is under no circumstances to be read by a human, unless that person is a subject of an authorized test. SCP-592 is only to be analyzed by computer, using the systems provided. The book is to be scanned on a per-page basis, using the scanner provided. The scanned image is then sent to the analysis machine. The scanner and other devices are modified such that they can be used while wearing the visual distortion goggles. Note, researchers must pass Training Course 305-S, Intermediate Braille and Training Course 10-E, use of SCP imaging software, before being approved to test SCP-592. The analysis machine is modified such that it contains and supports no non-volatile, permanent, writable storage devices, such that it never stores a copy of the scanned image that may persist beyond the analysis phase. The image is destroyed from the system RAM as soon as is possible through standard secure memory flushing routines. The firewall is configured to study incoming packets for characteristics of properly processed output, and destroys the packet if an insufficient amount of characteristics are discovered. This prevents the transmission of text or images that have not been sufficiently obfuscated. As SCP-592 is heavily illustrated, there are two analysis protocols. Analysis of text The analysis machine uses industry standard optical character recognition systems to parse the text in the image, and then destroys the image. The text file is then passed through a series of custom natural language processing routines to summarize the text. The original text file is then destroyed, and the summary is sent to the Secure Foundation intranet. The NLP routines analyze the passage using statistical methods incorporating databases of diverse English corpora, some details of other SCPs, a correct chronology of events extracted from various texts, and a severely limited referential network of other entries in SCP-592. Efforts to increase the degree in which analysis references other events resulted in an incident whereby resulting in three researchers being euthanized. See document SCP-592. The summary is composed in such a way as to mitigate any possibility of exposure to the true material of the passage, but still provide useful analytical details about the event described. An example, SCP-592-SUMM0907776 A. Note, lexical tokens from source databases are presented in all caps. Date, September 7, 1977. Location, Southern United States, 99% certainty. States, 79%, 11%, or 9% certainty. Type, Newspaper Clipping. Summary, The passage is describing human conflict. The human conflict is of an ideological or religious nature. The passage seems 56% to be lamenting in tone. The passage contains the numbers 2000, 1977, and 16. A relation to event SUMM010777C and event is likely 78% certainty. It is certain 98% that the passage contains a reference to both SCP and SCP. Related Incidents Incident 592- Loss of a limb following exposure to SCP-592 article on war Analysis of Images SCP-592 contains around 200 illustrations. These are cropped from the scanned image as part of the OCR routine. The image is then subjected to a number of Fourier transforms and convolutions to obscure the resulting output from human recognition while simultaneously analyzing its structure and providing a summary of its contents by statistical analysis. Record of the original image is then destroyed. An example report, SCP-592-IMG-098 Date, April 1, 1963 Location, Unknown Bedroom with Western Furnishings Type, Full Color Photograph Subject The image contains two adult persons standing one human child sitting on a chair or stool, an SCP 
With 100% certainty, the persons in the image should have facial features. With 100% certainty, the persons in the image do not have facial features. Item number SCP-1554 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-1554 is to be kept in a fireproof safe class storage locker in Site 629's Anomalous Media Wing. Testing is to be conducted under the supervision of Dr. Walters, and all instances of SCP-1554-A produced are to be stored on a case-by-case -case basis. Viable biological specimens are to be kept in Site 629's greenhouse. All fauna created from SCP 1554 A is to be euthanized, dissected, and incinerated following testing. Models produced by SCP 1554 A may be displayed in Site 629's archival wing, provided they are non hostile in nature. Inanimate objects are to be disposed of on a case by case basis following inspection. All metallic objects are to be melted down and converted into scrap. All testing is to occur in a room with a waterless fire extinguishing system. No flame tests are to be carried out on SCP-1554 under any circumstances. SCP-1554 is a copy of the book The Fellowship of the Ring by J. R. R. Tolkien, published in 1969 by Press. SCP-1554 is in very poor condition for its age, with several pages being marked with pen, pencil, and crayon. Moderate water damage to later chapters, and the entirety of the chapter in the house of Tom Bombadil being missing. By itself, SCP-1554 will gravitate to the nearest flat, dry surface and will stand on end, opening itself to the first undamaged page. The act of damaging any pages of SCP-1554 in any way produces an instance of SCP-1554-A. SCP-1554-A are items that form themselves out of a page of SCP-1554 that has been damaged in some way. The instance of SCP-1554-A varies depending on the type of damage caused to SCP-1554. Water damage typically produces quasi-biological specimens. Tearing out pages of SCP-1554 produces small, often autonomous sculptures depicting scenery and characters from the Fellowship of the Ring, and marking on pages produces inanimate, usually damaged objects, such as clothing or weaponry. Finally, burning the pages of SCP-1554 causes a sudden gravitational shift of approximately G in a random direction, invariably resulting in severe injuries and major damage to all individuals and objects within a 5-meter radius of SCP-1554, including SCP-1554 itself. Typically, gravitational anomalies will continue until SCP-1554 is extinguished. Addendum. Sample log of tests performed on SCP-1554 Passage used None. Front cover was damaged. Damage to SCP-1554. An X was drawn on the front cover using a felt-tip pen. Result in SCP-1554-A instance. No reaction from SCP-1554. Passage used. Prologue. Concerning Pipeweed. Page 8. Damage to SCP-1554. Application of 5 ml of water to the passage. Result in SCP-1554-A instance. SCP-1554-A-4 is a species of Nicotiana, resembling Nicotiana rustica. Analysis shows that SCP-1554-A-4 has a relatively low concentration of nicotine. Upon incineration, a large quantity of smoke was produced, described as smelling vaguely sweet and homely. Passage used Book 1 Chapter 1 A Long Expected Party Page 27 Damage to SCP-1554 Crossing out a passage using number 2 pencil. 
resulted SCP-1554 A instance. Damaged page was converted into SCP-1554 A10, a large rocket type firework. SCP-1554 A10 was disposed of in a nearby bomb disposal range due to the possibility of damage to the casing causing instability. SCP-1554-A-10 was detonated with no anomalous effects. Passage Used Book 2 Chapter 5 The Bridge of Khaza Doom Damage to SCP-1554 Tearing out page 265 Result in SCP-1554-A instance SCP-1554-A-21 was an animate model of what is believed to be the Balrog encountered in this chapter. SCP-1554-A-21 was on fire at time of emergence, and was quickly extinguished to prevent damage to SCP-1554. Extinguishing resulted in formation of 15 new SCP-1554-A instances due to moisture damage. Waterless fire extinguishing system installed following this test. Incident 1554-7 SCP-1554 was ignited due to a cigarette lighter smuggled into the testing chamber by D-1554-7, a known pyromaniac. Following this, D-1554-7 was thrown against the northern wall of the testing unit and reported severe difficulty moving and breathing as SCP-1554 continued to burn. SCP-1554 appeared to use gravity as a self-defense measure in a similar manner to SCP-2919. A link between these two anomalies has yet to be established. D-1554-7 was ordered to smother the flames by rolling over SCP-1554, but was unable to comply due to the strength of the gravitational force. Fire extinguishing system activated. D-1554-7 expired due to a lack of oxygen in the testing chamber. Addendum. The following document was found written on the back of SCP-1554's original catalog card in the University Library. The card was attached to a length of string intended for use as a bookmark. Right, enough of this. Enough of you lot tearing out bits and pieces of this work. I've had it with you lot tearing up Tolkien's work. You simply don't understand the man. He is a gift to English literature and if you ruin one more fucking page, there will be consequences. The more you destroy, the more you shall create. Words are art. Respect them. Item number 6952 Level 4 Secret Containment Class Safe Secondary Class Thaumiel Disruption Class Eki Risk Class Notice Assigned Site Site 78 Site Director Leia Richter Research Head Maria Johnston Assigned Task Force Omega-45 Street Samurai Special Containment Procedures SCP-6952 is to be kept sealed within an adamantite case when not in use, and may only be removed with authorization from members of Omega-45 or designated researchers who possess Level 4 clearance or above. Before construction begins, new entries within SCP-6952 must be approved first by the Ethics Committee, and instances of SCP-6952-1 shall only be used by members of Omega-45. In the event that a member of Omega-45 falls in combat, any SCP-6952-1 weaponry must be retrieved or scuttled at all costs. Foundation recovery sites are built around instances of SCP-6952-2 for their retrieval, and any discoveries of SCP-6952-2 by civilians should be promptly recovered and covered up. Witness anesthetization should be applied as needed. Description: SCP-6952 is a leather-bound book with metal covers. On the spine of SCP-6952 is an engraving that reads, Six of Nine. 
SCP-6952 is a manual on the creation and development of anomalous weapons and armor, hereby classified as SCP-6952-1 instances. The creation of new instructions on SCP-6952-1 instances is triggered by writing on a blank page of the book, which will prompt the anomaly to start writing schematics, forgery instructions, and usage guidelines. Currently, there are three known limits to the manual. It is unable to create weapons that can damage anomalies with indestructible or immortal properties, and other books of the set of nine. Furthermore, queries to build weapons to target the author of SCP-6952 will not be answered. SCP-6952-2 instances are anomalous materials and devices that facilitate the anomalous properties of SCP-6952-1 weaponry. SCP-6952-2 instances are created along with SCP-6952-1 if the requisite materials do not already exist. Repeated queries to the manual will lead to different SCP-6952-1s being created. These resources show promise for a variety of uses outside of weapons development and research is currently ongoing into their applications. Anecdotally, describing or asking for documents regarding things that aren't considered weaponry will result in a failed query. The request must be distinctly for something like a sword, gun, bomb, or similar objects. SCP-6952 appears to be able to create more pages for its weapons if all of them are filled with queries. Instances of SCP-6952-1 that are approved by the Ethics Committee are allowed for use by MTF Omega-45 to aid in the capture of anomalies and combat with hostile GOI units. This weaponry provided by SCP-6952 has aided in the capture of over 50 anomalies thus far. Discovery SCP-6952 was discovered on May 3, 2022 by a mixed unit of Valkyries belonging to the Val Raven Corporation. All-female cyborg combat unit designed for infiltration. This unit was deployed against GOI-8947, Bulk Division, a mercenary group that was sighted using anomalous and unidentified weaponry. The Valkyries were successful in eliminating the mercenaries and retrieved SCP-6952 from their operating base. After returning SCP-6952 to the Val Raven, the High Table contacted the O5 Council a few days later, offering to trade SCP-6952 for information on SCP-6755. Val Raven Corporation's Board of Directors The following video transcript was declassified and made available to Level 4 personnel to appraise them on the situation involving the Set of Nine and the Val Raven Corporation. Video Log 05 Council Meeting Data Expunged Recording Started 05-1 Greeting, CEO. We haven't spoken since the Cartagena Agreement was signed. I trust you're doing well. HTCEO Our organization has been thriving, 05-1. Profits are high. Contracts are flowing. Can't complain. 05-2 05-1 I must state that I don't believe the Foundation should be extended unwarranted cordiality towards mercenaries. 05-3 Dash 2 is right. If it wasn't for our pressure, the Corporation would still be employing anomalies in warfare without any regard for the veil or collateral damage. HTCIO Our Foundation hands so clean of blood? Our clients hire us to protect normalcy when the Foundation doesn't feel like getting their hands dirty. 05-1 Let's not sidetrack into unproductive bickering. As I understand, Val Raven's CEO has come to us with an offer. Let's not waste more of our precious time with nonsense. HTCEO Well, and regardless of past disagreements, I was hoping to improve our relationship by offering the O5 a gesture of goodwill. I am going to offer you one of the books in the Set of Nine, to shore up your defenses in light of the recent attack 
on one of your facilities by the Chaos Insurgency. 05-4 Set of 9? I don't believe I'm familiar with this item. 05-5 I believe he is referring to SCP-6419. I will send all the Council the relevant documentation. In regards to SCP-6419, Site-78 has theorized that there may be more books belonging to its set due to it apparently being second in a set. HTCOO Our Valkyries recently retrieved Volume 6, and after some examination, we conclude this anomaly would be better off under the Foundation's watch. We certainly admire the Foundation's compromise for worldwide security and peace, and we are always glad to contribute in the best way we know. We only ask for some information in return. 05-2 Retrieved it from whom? And I can't imagine it was a bloodless affair. HTCOO We acquired it from the Bulk Division when we noticed a sudden increase in their capacity for anomalous weaponsmithing. Our actions ensured they were returned to baseline. At this rate, you may as well consider outsourcing some of your duties to us. 05-2 The Nerve Don't act like you are a charity organization. The Bulks must have been up to something if somebody hired you to get rid of them. Probably squeezed some local governments out of a significant amount of money. HTCFO It was a very profitable venture, especially with Volume 6 in our hands. We've taken the call on it, Hephaestus' Manual. It's a book that allows its users to write queries for weapons and armor. These queries are then answered with weapon schematics and anomalous materials to create them. 05-3 so you're already stripped it of everything useful and are trying to hand it off to us? Why not just keep it? HTCEO We've determined that it is more beneficial and profitable for us in the long term to have the SCP Foundation as a strong force in the world, and you have information relevant to us. 05-2 What exactly are you asking for? HTCOO we would like to request you share the SCP-6755 file with us. Once we have that intel, we'll transfer the book to your care. 05-3 The Pale Lady? What exactly are you going to do with that information? HTCIO That is classified. 05-2 There's more you're not telling us. You walked into this conversation knowing full well there was a set of nine as you call it, and the fact we had one in our possession. HTCEO A good player never reveals all his cards. Now, do we have a deal? 05-1 We will put it to a vote. All members pass their votes to determine if we should trade for Volume 6 in exchange for information on SCP-6755. 05-1 Dash 5, dash 7, dash 9, dash 10, dash 11 vote yes. Dash 2, dash 3, dash 6, dash 8, dash 12 vote no. Motion passes. 7 to 5. 05 dash 1. The majority has spoken. We will transfer that information to the high table shortly. HTCEO. We're glad you came to the right decision. We'll have a representative over with the cargo in 24 hours. Oyen Ayor Allah Old Norse for, quote, Odin owns you all, unquote. Addendum 6952.01 Curated list of current SCP-6952-1 instances. Goss Rifle Weapon Type Assault Rifle Firing Mode Full Auto Three Round Burst Single fire. Effective range: up to 1.5 kilometers. Projectile speed: 1,120 meters per second. Mach 3.38. Ammunition: 8 mm tungsten anti-armor sabot. Magazine size: 50 round magazine. One battery rated for up to 800 shots. Required SCP-5952-2 instance. Coronal Ferrite Author Bulk Division Description The Goss Rifle is a ballistic projection device 
shaped like a conventional rifle firearm, but uses a coil gun design in place of gunpowder propulsion. Coil gun design incorporates electromagnetism in place of conventional gunpowder explosions. The bullets in a coil gun are not bullets, but simply solid ferromagnetic objects with aerodynamic shapes. This previously theoretical design would allow for higher speeds with deadlier ammunition, and with the superconductor, it needs very little maintenance due to few moving parts. Inside the chassis of the gun is a series of coils wrapped around the barrel made from coronal ferrite, which is a metal with anomalous heat resistance and superconducting properties. Coronal ferrite lacks electrical resistance, allowing the coils to be more power efficient and generate enough magnetic pull to accelerate the projectile at supersonic speeds. Most critically, the gun doesn't generate heat. A ferromagnetic projectile is provided by the magazine into the barrel, with an anomalous magnetic shield around the magazine's remaining ammunition to prevent the gun from ripping itself apart. To compensate for the added recoil of the higher speed projectile, kinetic dampeners were installed into the Gauss rifle's chassis by combining previous Foundation designs with ones provided by SCP-6952. This results in a ballistic delivery system with less recoil than even many pistols. The rifle can be equipped with an underbarrel 38mm laser-guided Heat-9 rocket. High-explosive anti-tank an explosive charge collapses a metal liner into a hot super-plastic jet to cut through armor. Several variants have been developed for anti-personnel and anti-armor purposes. SCP-6952-2 Description Atomic Number 26 Symbol C-FE Location Ural Mountains, Rocky Mountains, Himalayas, to be discovered Melting Point 10,000 degrees Celsius. Coronal ferrite is an allotrope of iron found in mountainous regions where the atmospheric pressure is the lowest. It appears to act like regular iron under all circumstances, except for its extremely high melting point. Almost zero electrical resistance and superconducting capability. While this makes it harder to forge, the result is a superconductive metal, allowing for the development of rail guns and coil guns. Other potential applications of this material are broad, from space exploration to deep core drilling. Researchers notes, If I am being honest, I'm no gun expert, but the men and women of Omega-45 give it their thumbs up. The sheer force of bullets' kinetic energy is highly effective against heavy layers of composite armor, like that of tanks, and if that isn't good enough, you have the missile launcher. In the field, the weapon has been performing admirably. Our boys shred insurgency folks like paper, and the tungsten bullets don't bounce off of tougher anomalous hides. High Velocity Blade Weapon Type Bladed Weapon Usage UV Generator needs to be charged for 48 hours of use. Required SCP-6952-2 Instance Ultrasonic Vibration Generator Author Bulk Division Description. Utilizing an ultrasonic vibration generator, the affected blade begins to vibrate at a rate of 10,000 Hz. The intense vibration of the atomic structure of the blade causes the bond of the target to disintegrate, leading to an easier cut. Foundation personnel combine a high-carbon adamantine blade with these generators to create weapons that can nearly cut through anything. Every high-velocity blade is fitted with a vibration-proof handle to prevent discomfort or harm to the user. Researchers notes, The high-velocity blades are quite an interesting development. We haven't yet come across a singular material that the blades can't cut through, although there is a limit to how much armor they can get through in a single swing. You can't cut a tank or a mech in half of this thing. That would be ridiculous. Researcher Johnston Hephaestus grade body armor Armor type Helmets bullet-resistant plates, etc. Required SCP-6952-2 instance Anamantite Author, Bulk Division Design refined by SCP Armaments Limited Description By using the anomalous properties of Anamantite, 
a metal with similar properties to graphene. The Foundation was able to create lighter weight bulletproof vests and plates for plate carriers that render a soldier nigh invincible from conventional weapons. The technology can be applied to all types of heavier metal armor and explosion-proof suits. In applications where the asbestos grade plate would be too heavy and impair the user, a powered exoskeleton was developed to aid the user in remaining protected and keeping mobility. SCP-6952-2 Description Chemical Formula B4A Hardness 38 GPA Fracture Toughness 6.5 MPA Location of adamantite deposits Earth's crust Composition is now 1% adamantite Preparation 2B203 plus 7A through B4A plus 6AO Adamantite is an anomalous metal being held by Foundation scientists as a new wonder metal. Compared to boron carbide, boron adamantide is twice as strong. Adamantine shares the property of carbon, with the added bonus of being able to be made into steel. Boron adamantite is a super dense, highly conductive material. It's great for making metal mattresses, cutting tools, and most importantly, body armor. Its increased neutrono absorption capability makes it excellent for the construction of neutron bombs, in the event there is an anomaly that requires such dire measures. Researchers notes, No metal is indestructible, and neither is body armor. What we've dubbed Hephaestus Grade is easily one of the largest leaps in armor technology we have for our MTF. While anomalous means are required to destroy it, We've had a bit of fun trying the old conventional ways of trying to dent a asbestos plate. Researcher Johnston Matter Displacing Gauntlet Weapon Type Glove Effective Range 100 meters. Maximum Mass Transferred 150 kg Uses 100 before needing to recharge the battery Required SCP-6952-2 Instance Atomic Resonator Author Researcher Johnston Description The matter-displacing gauntlet utilizes the atomic resonator, an instance of SCP-6952-2, in order to teleport a target to the wearer at the speed of light. When activated, the resonator locks onto a chosen target determined by the line of sight. The resonator then begins taking measurements of the target's particles. Position, moment, spin, and polarization, and then creates a copy of the user's current position, creating entanglement between them. This entanglement information is stored as qubit, a way of storing quantum data. It is comprised of a zero and a one, rather than a traditional bit, which is only a one or a zero. A quantum channel is thus opened, and the target begins sending the information in qubits to the resonator to recreate the target at light speed. Once the resonator has created the perfect duplicate, it ensures the target was created with its original quantum state and discards the original target information. Thus, it is not true teleportation, but rather the recreation of data at another location. Researchers notes, This was my attempt to see if I could use SCP-6952 to revolutionize particle science, and I think I've done it. The gauntlet perfects quantum teleportation and quantum entanglement on a macro scale. Just imagine the applications for what we can do with this technology. Full-scale teleporters, instant communication. I have very high hopes that this gauntlet could be the future of further quantum research. Researcher Johnson Bouncing Mary Bouncing Ball Grenade Weapon type, explosive Blast yield, varies Radius, varies Required SCP-6952-2 Instance Hacks Author, Maria Johnston Description The Bouncing Mary has the shape of a regular rubber bouncing ball, but in reality, it is made of 95% SCP-E-45, securely constructed pure explosive number 45. SCP-E-45's kinetic absorption property allows the ball to absorb the kinetic energy of its impact storing five times the initial energy inside of itself. When fifteen bounces are reached, the explosive is primed and begins to glow. 
the user only needs to depress the trigger for 5 seconds to activate the 10 second fuse. It will automatically detonate on the next impact. SCP-6952-2 Description Primary Ingredient Hacks Hephaestus Anomalous Explosive Or Adamanhexogen O2N2AH2-3 Description SCP-E-45 is a plasticized explosive, similar to C-4, with an explosive power that is 2.5 times that of a kilogram of TNT, before its anomalous property is activated. The addition of adamantite into the formula RDX allows the material to anomalously store kinetic energy that is applied to it by a magnitude of five times. The primary ingredient of C4 This allows users in the field to increase the blast yield without worrying about accidental detonation or having to use SCP-E45. Researchers notes, I based this on the bouncing Betty mines from World War II. I figured that I should make something out of the box, and I've always had a fondness for rubber bouncy balls. The men say that this has no tactical advantage on the battlefield, but hey, it's a self-defense thing for me, so I'm keeping it. Hacks also works well as a C4 replacement. Want bigger bangs? Just throw the thing at a wall a few times. Researcher Johnston Addendum 6952.02 Testing with the creation of SCP-6952-1 instances On petition by Researcher Johnston, the Ethics Committee allowed for the attempted queries of more impractical requests of SCP-6952 to test its weapons-making capabilities. Query number 1. Goss Rifle with a Toaster Attachment Result Instructions for one Goss Rifle with a toaster in the middle of the rifle's chassis. Toaster is powered from the Goss Rifle's battery. Toaster works as normal. Query number 2. Weaponizable Butter Result SCP-6952 outlined a recipe for butter with a pH level of 14.0, comparable to 1.0 M sodium hydroxide. Query number 3. A Screwdriver Result SCP-6952 produced a Goss Rifle variant that fired screws as ammunition. It is believed that while screwdrivers are unable to be produced, mass drivers that fire screws are acceptable. Query number 4. A bust of Researcher Johnston. Result, not applicable. Query number 5. A kitchen fork. Result, SCP-6952 produced instructions for a trident. Query number 6. A spoon. Result, not applicable. Query number 7. A weaponizable spoon. Result, not applicable. Query number 8. A door. Result, SCP-6952 produced instructions for a trap door into another dimension. The instance would not produce due to the concern of not knowing what might come out of the other side. Query number 9. Electric bread slicer. Result, not applicable. Query number 10. Electric Human Slicer Result. SCP-6952 created instructions for an electrically powered knife that anomalously cut flesh better than it did bread. Conclusions Well, I'm glad this thing never runs out of paper with how much junk we filled it with. It appears that its purpose of the weapons manual is pretty strict. It can work around some definitions, like turning a fork into what is essentially a weaponized fork. However, things that are strictly meant for tool or decoration purposes give bum results. Sometimes you could cheat it by wordplay or using certain prefixes, but other times nothing happens. Researcher Johnston Addendum 6952.03 Interview with Valkyrie Operative Delestris On March 10, Foundation Retrieval Teams managed to geolocate the location of the Valkyrie skirmish with the Bulk Division. MTF Omega-45 was sent to retrieve any instances relating to SCP-6952 that were potentially left behind by either side. It appeared as though the area had been picked clean. Fifty bulk division casualties were confirmed, along with one Valkyrie. When the Valkyrie was approached, it suddenly came back online and started to whimper for help. This Valkyrie was later determined to be of the Greek branch of the Bal Raven Corporation, codename Karaki Tun Skullamenon. 
Greek for Raven of the Slain. This Valkyrie was willing to give information on the Valve Raven Corporation in exchange for asylum. Interview Log Valkyrie A-04 The Lestris Recording started. A-04 is seated in front of Researcher Johnston. A-04's armor is reminiscent of a Greek hoplite, and she appears to be of Mediterranean descent. Johnston, stating my name for the record, Researcher Maria Johnston, interviewing Valkyrie Operative Thelestris, number 4 of the Androlotarii. Greek for Destroyers of Men A-04 Your pronunciation is good, Doctor. I assume you have questions about what happened on the mission. I'm not a doctor, at least not yet. You can call me Johnston. Back to the topic at hand, yes? I'd like to be filled in. I can. It was supposed to be a relatively simple op. Me and my commander, Hippolyte, were paired with two Severomea to eliminate some bulk mercenaries and take out their weapons workshop. Icelandic for Sword Maiden and the several Meha, who I assume are Nordic branch. Who were they exactly? One of them was a commander, Brenhild, real hard-ass for what I'd seen of her. She was getting annoyed with her subordinate Sigrun during the whole mission. The Volks had done something particularly bad to Sigrun, not sure what, but she would really riled up to engage with them. Did that affect the mission at all? Not at all. We arrived at the workshop. Brenhild and Sigrun snuck in and eliminated all of them. Me and Hippolyte were keeping guard outside. I had to admit, they were pretty capable for a bunch of fanatics. You don't think highly of the Nordic branch? Normally you wouldn't catch me dead near one of those Nordic crows. They believe that going to Hades is a bad thing, and that by dying in combat they'll go to the land of the gods. It's madness. Mount Olympus is reserved for immortals only. It's heresy to believe otherwise. Interesting. I wasn't aware that there were other religions in Balraven. There are plenty of pagan religions in Balraven. We have a Mesoamerican branch, Shinto, Greek of course, and many more. We may call them by different names and worship them differently. All of us have different ideas about where we're going to end up after all this. But at the end of the day, Kukulkan is just Jormungandir by another name, and the comparison can go on with all the other big snakes. It's the one thing that stops us from just tearing each other apart. It's a unique way of interpreting the theology. So what happened after Brynhild and Sigrun cleared the warehouse? We came to get the place ready for a retrieval team, when we saw Brynhild scolding Sigrun. There was his corpse near Sigrun, absolutely torn apart. Brynhild was trying to tell her that her revenge mission against some guy named Grigori was going to get her killed. Sigrun, however was gloating about being able to get Grigori's unit information from the guy. Anyway, we told them both to stow it, and that's when it happened. We got ambushed. They were waiting for you? I don't know how they knew, but the wolves were all over us. The operations department told us to get the hell out of there, but there were too many of them. I took a round from one of the rifles, which ripped straight through my chassis, hurt like hell. I know the kind you're talking about. Goss weapons are terrifying. You don't know the half of it. Anyways, my commander tells them to leave me. Spartan philosophy, you see. Weak don't deserve to be saved from the battle build. Brynhild and Sigrun disagreed, but my commander outranked them. My commander gave me one last task. Detonate the explosives they had on the site and cover their escape. Scorched Earth. And you did? Even with injuries like that? Your body was absolutely torn apart by the time we found you. I cut them all down. Every one of those rabid dogs. I made it to the cache and blew them all sky high. I had my golden coin on me to give the ferryman when I went out, but he never came. I guess my backup systems kept my organs alive long enough for you to find me. That's quite the story. Can you go back? Why do you want to stay with us? I'm a warrior through and through, like the Athenians and Spartans before us, but Valraven? They don't have honor. Why would I want to be a part of an organization that doesn't care about its soldiers? No one came back for me, not even the Severomea. Even if the Severomea would want, even if the Severomea wanted to, 
They likely assumed you were dead. I agree. Val Raven probably wrote me off of the loss. Just another negative in their ledger. God damn it. I used to be a soldier fighting for a good cause before those damn suits showed. I lost my arms on a UN peacekeeping mission, but then they came. We'll give you a purpose, they said. You'll feast on the battlefield once more. So what did I do? Of course I said yes. I wanted my arms back. That's how they get you. They came to me because I couldn't say no. More like vultures rather than crows. Well, I am preparing to offer you something. Your record shows that you are a capable warrior, and we need somebody to train our MTF in case the Cartagena Agreement goes sour. Delestrius, I am offering you a place in one of our mobile task forces. My boys call themselves the Street Samurai. Would you like to join? It's better than sitting in one of your containment cells for the rest of my life. Excellent. It'll take a while to get the paperwork approved. This is a bit of an unusual move, but I want the best of the best in Omega-45. You'll also probably have to have a failsafe installed in your cybernetics, like an easy shutoff. I'll do whatever it takes. I'm no stranger to having hardware installed. Hopefully our partnership will be better than my last one. End of recording. After the interview, Researcher Johnston sent a petition to Midwest Command to request that A-04 transfer to MTF Omega-45. The application is still pending. From the Office of Site Director Leia Richter, the following notice has been disseminated to all personnel employed within Site-78. Attention to all staff. Due to the involvement with the Val Raven Corporation in the efforts to retrieve the remaining books in the Set of Nine, all mobile task forces are to be on high alert for Val Raven interference in our containment operations. All MTFs are not to engage with Val Raven personnel in combat, unless an order has been given down by the Overseer Council. The Cartagena Agreement prevents us from open conflict, but they've made clear through their actions that, like with the insurgency and bulk division before them, they are attempting to locate the missing volumes in the set. We do not need to break our long-standing agreement without reason but we cannot allow any of these volumes to fall into their hands. Containing the set is now this site's utmost priority, and if it comes a day when we must fight the Bow Raven for control of the set, we will be ready. Site 78, please remain vigilant. These are troubling times. Foundation Mobile Access Terminal Interlogin Credentials User Account Johnston M. XXX Apprentice Samurai XXX Welcome Employee Number 021E, Maria Johnston. You have zero pending messages. Send email. Recipient Greg Chudley at skip.net. Subject Regarding the connection between SCP 6952 and the set of nine. Body of message Hello, Greg. It has been a bit since our last correspondence. I apologize that I've been so tight lipped on specifics on SCP 6952. Its classification of Thaumiel has necessitated Level 4 clearance. I've been trying to get Director Richter to relent, given that SCP-6952 is part of the ongoing research into the set. However, she seems adamant that your… electric personality isn't the right fit. Now, in regards to SCP-6952's connection with the set, I can say that, with SCP-6419 formerly in the hands of Chaos Insurgency and the Balraven Corporation, having knowledge of SCP-6952 before they retrieved it. I think something might be cooking in the GOI community that we just aren't aware of yet. We tried looking to see if we could exploit the rift between the main Nordic branch of Valraven with their overseas branches to see if any of them would give up something, but that turned up empty. The true author of these books evades us still. In addition, in addition, I received your list of queries and I was permitted to test them. It wouldn't reveal the identity of or make weapons that could kill its author. I am not suggesting trying to eliminate the author yet. But if we knew what kind of weapons could kill them, we could infer their identity. SCP-6952 would not make weapons that could destroy other books in the set. It won't respond to queries it can't make weapons for. If this thing has sentience, we haven't found any evidence of it yet. I hope that answers some of your questions. 
I'll keep you posted on any further developments. Send mail.